Good day, dear students. Uh, today we are going to have our lecture number 26 of social linguistics. Now, when we talk about social linguistics, once again, I want to remind you that it is the relation between language and society and how different languages in different societies and cultures and countries with examples of how people speak different languages and how they would perceive the language. Now, Salis in Salisbury, specifically, um, he, his research was about it, that he mentions that the interest taken in pidgin English when a group of laborers returned from the service on the coast, almost immediately um, school was established so that the rest of the village males could learn the pidgin language. Now, we have no reason to assume that such situations as these are abnormal in any way. So, um, there are so many village males that could learn the pidgin language by going to different schools that were established in the, um, that uh, society or that culture. So it's very similar to what you have in your culture in Pakistan also, where many females um, in villages uh, don't attend uh, the schools and only the males are allowed to. So, but now the, because the culture is changing, so uh, education is being given more importance, so uh, now we have a sort of um, almost equal ratio of male and female students. Now, we have no reason to assume that such situations are um, abnormal in any way because sometimes um, only the males in the villages are uh, dominant and uh, they are only uh, taught at school. So they learn the language. Now, in many parts of the world, people speak a number of languages, and individuals may not be aware of how many different languages they speak. So sometimes all over the world, if we look at the people living all around us, uh, we would say that um, so many people, uh, individuals uh, have um, the ability to speak different languages. And by doing that, they even they don't realize how many languages they know. They don't know if they're bilingual or multilingual because they're so used to speaking all the different types of dialects that uh, it is different, uh, difficult for them to distinguish uh, it in themselves that they are uh, multilingual or bilingual. So they speak them because they need to do so in order to live their lives. Now, their knowledge is instrumental and pragmatic. So most of it is instrumental and pragmatic because most of it is applied to real life situations. And that is how um, it's a necessity for them to speak the language. Now, in such situations, language learning comes naturally and is quite unforced. <clears throat> so most of the time in such situations, language learning would come naturally. That means that it's a natural effect that they just have to learn a language and it comes unforced. So bilingualism or multilingualism is not at all remarkable because they're used to that. So bilingualism and multilingualism is not at all remarkable because they are used to um, speaking different uh, languages and they're used to being bilingual or multilingual because it's just a common thing that they need to know uh, a certain amount of languages to survive in a society. Now to be a proper uh, Tucano, we were talking about Tucano people and their tribes and how uh, different tribes would speak different languages. So. To be a proper Tucano uh, or Sein, you must be a multilingual and a skilled user of languages, you know. That is an essential part of your Tucano or Sein identity. So for the Tucano people, like we to, um, spoke about before, that um, they marry in different tribes. They have to marry in a different tribe because they need to marry somebody who speaks a different dialect or a different type of language. The reason for that is that, uh, in, like in our societies, uh, they consider them uh, marrying in the same tribe with the same language as equal to being like uh, married to brother and sister, so that it would be very awkward. So that's why, they, according to their traditions, they would marry in a different tribe who speaks a different language. Now, for a Takano especially, to know the multi-languages -lang uh, is very essential also because they have to move from tribe to tribe. They have to communicate with 
with their in-laws. They have to communicate uh, with the families of their in-laws. So uh, it's a essential part of their identity, basically, or the saying also. Now, a different kind of bilingual situation exists in Paraguay. So uh, a different kind of bilingual situation exists in Paraguay. That means that they have a different way of um, dealing with bilingualism. So because uh, of its long isolation from Spain and a paucity of its Spanish-speaking population, an American Indian language, um, Guarani has flourished in uh, Paraguay to the extent that today uh, it is the mother tongue of about 90% of the population and the second language of several additional percent. So Gurani is um, recognized as a national language. Now on the other hand, Spanish, which is the sole language of less than 7% of the population, is the official language of government and the medium of education. Now, although um, in recent years some use um, has been made of Gurani in the primary education of Spain also. So in the 1951, since just, uh, just over half the population were bilingual in Gurani and Spanish. So they knew both the languages. Now these figures indicate that the lesser known language is Paraguay, in Paraguay is Spanish. Now the capital city, Asuncion, is almost entirely bilingual. So, but the further uh, one goes into the countryside, away from cities and towns, and more monolingually uh, Guarani speaking, the population becomes. So Spanish Guarani exists in a relationship that fishermen in 1980 calls extended diglossic, in which Spanish is the H variety and Guarani the L variety. So Spanish is the language used on formal occasions. Now it is always used in government business, uh, in conversation with strangers who are well dressed, uh, with foreigners and in most business transactions. So people use Qurani however with friends, servants and strangers who are poorly dressed, in the confessional, when they tell jokes or make love and on most casual occasions also. So Spanish is the preferred language of the cities but Qurani is preferred in the countryside and the lower classes. Almost always use it for just about every purpose in rural areas. So in villages they use Qurani uh, as a normal routine. Now parents may attempt to help their children improve their knowledge of Spanish by using Spanish more in their presence at home or in wherever they are with the child. For after all, Spanish is the language of the educational opportunity and is socially preferred. And with Gurani, like it's uh, more of a, a second language that uh, children would speak or learn at their homes instead of uh, in a formal education. So, but between themselves and with their children absent, they will almost certainly switch to Gurani. So, in the upper classes, males. Uh, may, uh, may well use Gurani with one another as a second sign of friendship. Now, upper class females prefer Spanish in such circumstances. Uh, outside Paraguay, uh, Paraguayans may deliberately choose to converse in Gurani to show their solidarity, uh, particularly when among other South American Spanish speaking people also. So uh, males may drink in Gorani but use more and more Spanish as they feel the influence of alcohol for Spanish is the language of power. So um, males, uh, maybe they would um, accompany each other, uh, let's say in pubs or in clubs where they could uh, drink alcohol together. Um, but they would start out speaking Gurani, but then they would uh, shift to speaking uh, Spanish after they are under the influence of alcohol because um, according to them, the person who speaks Spanish would have more power in the society. And so Spanish may also be the language they use, um, they choose to use when addressing superiors 
and uh, there may be conflict in choosing between Spanish and Gurani in addressing parents or grandparents. So in such situations, solidarity tends to win over power and Gurani is often the choice. Now courtship may begin in Spanish. Courtship means when you start dating someone. So um, courtship may begin in Spanish. If it goes anywhere, it will proceed in Qurani. So further on, when they get comfortable with each other, then they would start speaking in Qurani. So uh, men tell jokes and talk about women and sports in Qurani, uh, but they discuss business affairs in Spanish. So it's a weird sort of culture where there is a mixture where both the languages are a must. Now we can see therefore that the choice between Spanish and Gurani depends on a variety of factors. The location, city or country that you're belonging in or you're a residence of. Um, formality, how formal the situation is. Gender, if you're speaking with uh, the male uh, or the female or males interacting with males and females interacting with females. Uh, the status, that shows their power. Intimacy, how close a relationship is when they get more comfortable with each other, they will switch from Spanish to Qurani. Uh, seriousness, when they want to talk about uh, business uh, matters, they would speak in Spanish. And when they're talking about ca casual stuff like sports, they would uh, speak Qurani. And uh, th those types of activities. So the choice of one code rather than the other is obviously related to the situation. How they choose the code? Am I going to speak the Spanish code or the high quality or the low quality, which would be Qurani? So uh, the high variety would be Spanish, so they will choose between that according to the situation or whatever condition they are in. Now, <clears throat> Perikawa uh, identity requires you to be attuned to the um, uses of uh, Spanish Qurani and um, Qurani to be aware that uh, they mean different things and that it is not only what you say that is important but uh, which language you choose to say it in. So it's very important for them to see that um, <clears throat> whatever language they are speaking in, <clears throat> if the important things are um, like say business and stuff, so they need to choose between which language to use in what situation. Now in Papua New Guinea, uh, there are many languages and an increasing used lingua franca, uh, Tok Paisen, uh, many people are puri, uh, plural, uh, plural lingual. That means that they have a lot, they know a lot of languages. So the Yemis of Papua New Guinea use their own language in traditional pursuits and uh, talk uh, pacing for topics from encroaching outside world. So domestic matters and local food provision would be spoken in their own language. Largely the province, uh, province of females uh, call for Yemis just as do uh, mortuary fees and the province of males. Now, but matters do, uh, to do with the government, trade and travel require talk pacing the language talk person. So language choice among the Yimish uh, is dependent on occasion, according to the occasion therein. Now Yimish uh, to perform um, traditional practices and talk person to establish identity within a wider community. Now what have I tried to stress in this section is that bilingualism and multilingualism are normal in many parts of the world and that people in those parts would view any situation as strange and limiting. Now there is a long history in certain Western societies of people actually looking down on those who are bilingual. Now we have prestige to only um, a certain few classical languages, for example Greek and Latin, or modern languages of high culture, for example English, French, Italian and German. Now you generally get little credit for speaking Swahili and until recently at least not much more for speaking Russian, Japanese, Arabic or Chinese because these are not in, known as international languages. 
So bilingualism is actually sometimes regarded as a problem in many bilingual individuals. Um, they tend to occupy rather low positions in society and knowledge of another language becomes associated with inferiority. So bilingualism is sometimes seen as a personal and social problem also, not something that uh, has strong positive connotations. Now one un unfortunate a consequence is that some Western societies um, go to great lengths to downgrade, even eradicate the language that uh, immigrants bring with them while um, at the same time trying to teach foreign languages in school. Now, what is more uh, important is that they have uh, had much more success in doing the former than the latter. That means that they have had more success to speak uh, the languages in the certain si uh, situations. So I will return to this issue in specifically in connection with certain uh, recent developments in the United States. Now a bilingual or multilingual situation can produce uh, still other effects on one or more of the languages involved. Now, as we have uh, just seen, it can lead to loss, for example, language loss among immigrants. But sometimes uh, it leads to diffusion, that is certain features spread from one language to the other. So as a result of the uh, contact situation, now particularly certain kinds of syntactic features also. Now, this phenomena has been observed in um, such areas as the Balkans, the south of India, and Sri Lanka. Now, Gumpers and Wilson in uh, 1971 uh, report that in Kapwar, a small village of about 300 inhabitants in Mahashastra, uh, India, four languages are spoken. Now, Marathi and Urdu, both of which are Indo-European, and Kannada, uh, a non-Indo-European language. So a few uh, people speak, uh, also speak Telugu, also a non-Indo-European language. So the languages are distributed mainly by caste like who is from the upper class, that means uh, the social class. So who is from um, higher caste or uh, superior blood and who is from a lower one. Now the highest caste, the Jains, speak uh, Kannada and the lowest caste, the untouchables, speak Marathi. You can refer to this as in the Indian cultures, Aapko pata Brahman hai and Achut hai. ठीक है तो उसी तरह इंडिया में जैसे है वैसे ही यहाँ पे महाराष्ट्र में भी ऐसे ही है कि जैसे ब्राह्मण जो हाईएस्ट क्वालिटी कास्ट है ठीक है सुपीरियर जिनको कहेंगे वो किनारा बात में बात करते हैं और जो लोएस्ट कास्ट है जो अनटचेबल्स हैं लाइक जो अछूत होंगे वो मराठी में बात करेंगे now people in different castes must speak to one another and to the Telugu speaking rope makers. So the Urdu speaking Muslims must also be fitted in. So Urdu speaking Muslims ko bhi unhone beech mein fit karna hai. Bilingualism or even uh, trilingualism is normal particularly among the men. But it is the Marathi which dominates um, the intergroup uh, communication. So bilingualism just means two zubane aati hoon, trilingualism just means three zubane aati hoon is normal particularly among the men. But Marathi jo hai wo dominate karta hai intergroup communication ka. So still it would dominate it that means a more um, amount of people would speak Marathi. So one linguistic consequence, however, is that there has um, been some uh, convergence of the uh, languages uh, that are spoken in the village so far as syntax is concerned. So, but vocabulary differences have been maintained. So according to McMahon in 1994. Now it is vocabulary rather than syntax which now serves to distinguish the groups. And the variety of multilingualism that has resulted is a special local variety which has developed in response to the local needs. Now as a discussion if we would go and uh, think about it then uh, distinction is sometimes uh, made between communities 
in which there is stable bilingualism and those in which there is unstable bilingualism. Now, Switzerland and Canada and Haiti are cited as examples of the former and the linguistic situations found in cities like New York or among uh, many immigrant peoples as examples of the latter. Now, why are the terms stable and unstable useful in such circumstances? So you want to judge that. Now, the term bilingual is used in describing countries such as uh, Canada, Belgium and Switzerland. And also multilingual in this case, uh, what kind of bilingualism or multilingualism is this? So, you want to tell me what kind of bilingualism? Why is Canada, Canada Belgium and Switzerland considered as bilingual or multilingual? So, uh, in Canada you know that French and English are both spoken. In Switzerland we spoke about that there is uh, two types of German and then uh, their own language. So, uh, that's why that would be a multilingual, more than two. So, a speaker of English who wants to learn another language, now particularly an exotic one, uh, may find the task difficult. So, speakers of that other language may insist on using what little um, English they know rather than their own language and there may also be compelling social reasons that prevent the would-be learner from achieving any but a most rudimentary knowledge of the target language. So, what factors contribute to this kind of situation? How might you seek to avoid it? So, uh, is it possible to have a society in which everyone is completely bilingual in the same two languages and there is no diglossia? How stable would such a situation be? Um, some communities regard bilingualism as a serious threat. Um, it has uh, even been referred to as a Trojan horse, uh, initially attractive but ultimately fatal. So, why might this be, uh, be so? Why do you think that bilingualism would be a threat to any society? So, consider the experience of migration and also the sorry, sorry state of many minority languages in the world. So, then we move on to what we were talking about, which is um, code switching. Now, according to code switching, I have observed uh, that the particular uh, dialect or language that a person chooses to use on any occasion is a code or a system used for communication between two or more parties. So, I have also indicated that it is unusual for a speaker to have command of or use uh, only one such code or system. So, command of only a single variety of language, whether it be a dialect, style or register would appear to be an extremely rare phenomenon. Or one likely to uh, occasion comment. So, most speakers command several varieties of any language they speak and bilingualism, even multilingualism is the norm for many people throughout the world rather than the unilingualism. So, people then are usually required to select a particular code uh, whenever they choose to speak. And they may also decide to switch from one code to another or uh, to mix codes even within sometimes very uh, short utterances and thereby create a new code in a process known as code switching. So, code switching, also called code mixing, can occur in conversations between speakers the turns or within a single speaker's turn. So, then when we come in the latter case, <coughs> it can occur between sentences, uh, interessentially uh, or within a single sentence, uh, interessentially. So, code switching can arise from individual choice or be used as a major identity marker for a group of speakers who must deal with more than one language in their common pursuits. So, as Gal in 1988 says, code switching is a conversational strategy used to establish, uh, cross or destroy group boundaries, to create, evoke or change interpersonal relations uh, with their rights and obligations. We will now look more closely at this phenomenon. 
So when we look closely at this phenomena in a multilingual country like Singapore, the ability to shift from one language to another is accepted as quite normal. So it's considered normal to shift from one language to another in Singapore. Now, Singapore has uh, four official languages. So that would be considered as a multilingual um, society. Now, um, English, the Mandarin variety of Chinese, uh, Tamil and Malay. Now, Malay uh, would be which is uh, also the national language of um, Singapore. So they have Chinese, Mandarin, the variety of Mandarin Chinese. They have Tamil, they have uh, Malaysian, Malay, and they have the national language. Now, however, the majority of its population are native speakers of Hokkien, another variety of Chinese. So national policy promotes English as a trade language, Mandarin as the international Chinese language, and Malay as the language of the region, and Tamil as the language of one of the important ethnic groups in the republic. So what this means for a typical uh, Chinese child growing up in Singapore uh, is that he or she is likely to speak Hokkien with parents and informal Singapore English with the siblings. So <clears throat> conversation with friends will be in Hokkien or informal Singapore English. The language of education will be the formal variety of Singapore English and Mandarin. So any religious practices uh, will be conducted in the formal variety of Singapore English if the family is Christian, but in Hokkien if Buddhist or Taoist. So the language of government employment will be formal Singapore English, but uh, some Mandarin will be used uh, from time to time also. So however, shopping uh, will be carried on in Hokkien, informal Singapore English, and the bazaar variety of Malay used throughout the region. So you can see Platt and Platt in 1975 and uh, page 94 to 4 uh, for a fuller discussion. Now the linguistic situation in Singapore offers those who live there uh, a wide choice among languages. So with the actual choice made on a particular occasion determined by the kinds of factors just mentioned, it may even be possible to characterize the total linguistic situation in Singapore as a complicated uh, diglossic uh, one if we accept fishermen's um, view of diglossia. So we may also ask what happens when people uh, from a multilingual uh, society, uh, people who are themselves multilingual, uh, meet in a foreign setting. Uh, what language or languages do they use? So Tanner in 1967 uh, reports on the linguistic usage of a small group of Indonesian graduate uh, students and their uh, fam Lee's lives in the uh, living in the United States. Now, among them, these students knew nine different languages, with nearly everyone knowing Indonesian, Bahasa Indonesia, uh, Javanese, Dutch, and English. So, uh, they tended to discuss their academic work in English, uh, but used Indonesian for most of their common activities. So, unlike Javanese. Indonesian, whether the official or the daily variety, is regarded as a neutral um, democratic language. Now, a speaker of Indonesian need to commit himself to any particular social identity. So, nor need he input one of those with whom he converses. So, the students also use Dutch. So, they have a variety in Indonesia of speaking that, and the students would also use Dutch, but mainly as a resource for example, for vocabulary or because of the place it necessarily held in certain fields of the study, for example, Indonesian studies. Now, local languages like Javanese tended to be used only with intimates when fine shades of respect or distance were necessary, particularly when in the presence of important older people. 
So, like we were speaking, that uh, a speaker of Indonesian uh, would not commit himself to any particular social identity. So, uh, a local languages like Javanese tend to be used only with the intimates, so uh, when fine shades of respect or distance were necessary. So, particularly when in the presence of important older people in Indonesia, they would use the language of Javanese. So, according to Tanner's findings, uh, conformed to an earlier prediction made by uh, Gerritz in 1960. Now, Indonesian appeals uh, to those whose uh, sense, whose sense of uh, political nationality as Indonesians, rather than as Javanese, is most developed. So, to those who are interested in the cultural products of the new Indonesias, a mass media, let's say, and those who wish to take leadership positions in government and businesses also. So he adds that although the use of Indonesian for everyday conversation is still mostly confined to the more sophisticated uh, urban needs uh, and it's using, um, you suggest something of an air of public speaking for most uh, Javanese, it is rapidly becoming more and more integral uh, part of their daily cultural life and uh, will become even more so as the present generation of uh, school children grows to adulthood. So as kids would grow, so would that become uh, different. So Javanese will continue to be used uh, in certain special contexts and for certain special purposes. So situations such as those just described are not uncommon. So in Kenyan local languages, Swahili and English uh, all find use and choosing the right language to use on a particular occasion uh, can be quite a delicate matter. So, um, Whiteley in 1984 describes the kind of situation uh, that can occur between a member of the public and the members of the government uh, bureaucracy. So, a man wishing to see a government officer about renewing a license may state his request to the girl typist in Swahili as a suitably neutral language if he does not know her. So, to start off in English would be unfortunate if she did not know it and on her goodwill um, depends his gaining access to the authority reasonably quickly. So that's why he would try to please um, the secretary to, um, or the typist, so he would speak a language that uh, he definitely knows that uh, she will understand. Now, she may reply in Swahili if she knows it as well as he does and wishes to be cooperative, or in English if she is busy and not anxious to be disturbed, or in the local language if she recognizes him and wishes to reduce the level of formality. Now, if he in return knows little English, he may be put off at her use of it and decide to come back later. So, if he uh, knows it well, he may demonstrate his importance by insisting on an early interview and uh, gain his objective at the expense of the typist's goodwill. So, the interview with the officer may well follow a similar pattern being shaped. On the one hand, by the total repertoire mutually available, and on the other hand, by their respective positions in uh, relation to the issue involved. Now, this is how language is used in society and how it links uh, language and society uh, together. So you can see in different society, uh, societies there are different ways and social situations that people go through and they have to make use of the language to fit into that society. So, Trotkal in 1995 describes the situation in Kampala, uh, the capital of Uganda, which is similar in many respects. Now, the actual choice of code is a setting um, clearly marked as bilingual that can be a difficult task. Now, as Heller in 1982 has observed, language plays a symbolic role in our lives. And when there is a choice of languages, the actual choice may be 
very important. So particularly when there is a concurrent uh, shift in the relationship between the languages as is occurring in Montreal between English and French. So in certain uh, such circumstances as Heller observes, a negotiation in conversation is a playing out of a negotiation for position in the community at large. So Heller uh, studied the uses of the two languages in a Montreal hospital during the summer of 1977. Now which language was used uh, varied as circumstances changed. So what is particularly interesting is that the pattern uh, that has evolved of asking which language someone wishes to use in a public service encounter, <laughs> English or French, Anglais or uh, Francais, uh, is not very effective. So the reason is that too many other factors are involved to make the choice that simple. So they can make it that simple. They, uh, there are so many other factors also that either they would speak in English or in French. Uh, they just can't make that uh, um, choice so immediately. So the negotiation of language has to do with judgments of personal treatment. Now that is how one expects to be treated in such a situation, but such judgments are dependent upon social knowledge also. So knowledge about group relations and boundaries and ways of signaling them. And knowledge about other social differences, for example, status differences. So this negotiation itself serves to redefine the situations in the light of ongoing social and political change. Now in the absence of norms, we work at creating new ones. So the conversationalization of the negotiating strategies appears to be a way of normalizing relationships, of encoding social information, necessary to know how to speak to someone and which language to speak is but one respect, aspect of it. So most of Heller's examples show how the conversationalization uh, to which she refers that is asking the other which language is preferred often does not work very well in practice. So social and political relationships are too complicated to be resolved by a simple uh, linguistic choice. Now we can see um, still other examples of how a speaker may deliberately choose to use a specific language to assert some kind of right over that situation. So a bilingual, now in French and English, a French Canadian may insist on using French to an official of the federal government outside Quebec. Now a bilingual, a Catalan and Spanish speaker, let's say, Residents, uh, a resident of Barcelona may insist on using Catalan, a bilingual Welsh and English. A resident of Wales may insist on using Welsh and so on. So in these cases, so wherever you belong from people try to, they would insist to use their own uh, native language first instead of the second language. So in these cases, it's the same thing with you in Pakistan. Whenever you, uh, somebody would uh, start a conversation, you will always try to uh, choose to speak Urdu more than you would in English. So in these cases, code uh, choice becomes a form of political expression. A move either to resist some other power or to gain power or to express um, solidarity. So we are therefore turning to the issue of what brings a speaker to uh, choose variety of X of a language, A rather than variety Y, and even language A rather than language B. So what might cause a speaker to switch from variety X to variety Y, or from language A to language B? Now what do you think, students, that would make a person shift from that? Why would they want to shift from one language to the other during a conversation or from situation to situation? So a number of answers have been suggested to these questions, including solidarity, accommodation to listeners, choice of topic, and perceived social and cultural distance. Now, in other words, the motivation of the speaker is an important consideration in the choice. 
So moreover, such motivation uh, need not be at all conscious. So for apparently many speakers are not aware that they have used one particular variety of a language rather than another, or sometimes even that uh, they have switched languages either, either between or within utterances. Now equating in this uh, instant code with language, we can describe two kinds of code switching, situational and metaphorical. So situational code switching uh, would occur when uh, languages used um, change according to the situations in which the conversant uh, finds themselves or they speak one language in one situation and another in a different one, in a different situation. So no topic change is involved. So when a change of topic requires a change in the language used, we have metaphorical code switching. Now the interesting point here is that some topics may be discussed uh, in either code, but the choice of code adds a distinct flavor to what is said about the topic. The choice encodes uh, certain social values also. So linguists have found it very difficult to uh, explain precisely when uh, linguistically and socially uh, code switching occurs, that is like what all the constraints are. Now however, um, there is broad agreement about the general principles that are involved. So instances of co uh, situational code switching are usually fairly easy to classify for what they are. Now what we observe is that one variety is used in a certain uh, set of situations and another in an entirely different set. So what we say is that when you're code switching from one language to another, let's say, uh, to classify for what they are, then at that point you are, um, you would observe that one variety is used in a certain set of situations like there if you want to be uh, formal then there would be a set of language that you're going to use in a formal situation and if you're let's like, say in a completely different situation let's say a common um, situation with your friends in a frank sort of atmosphere then you would use the language that you're most comfortable with so however the changeover from one to other may be instantaneous in a chana kosakta same thing like when I'm translating to you, I, uh, I'm doing the lecture in English and then I would immediately uh, start speaking to you in Urdu. So sometimes the situations are so socially prescribed that they can uh, even be taught. For example, the, uh, those associated with ceremonial or religious functions, um, others may be more subtly determined, but speakers readily observe the norms. So this kind of code switching differs uh, from diglossia. In diglossic communities, the situation also controls the choice of variety, but uh, the choice is more, much more rigidly defined by the particular activity that is involved and by the relationship between the participants. So diglossia reinforces differences, whereas code switching tends to reduce them. So in diglossia, two people are quite aware that they have switched from H to L or L to H. So code switching, on the other hand, is often quite subconscious. So m people may not be aware that they have switched or be able to report following a conversation which uh, code they used for a particular topic. Now, as the term itself suggests, metaphorical code switching has an effective dimension to it. Uh, you change the code as you redefine the situation. Now, formal to informal, official to personal, serious to humorous, and politeness to solidarity. So, in a number of places, Gumpers, uh, particularly in 1982, cites examples of metaphorical code switching from three sets of languages, Hindi and English, Solovian and German and Spanish and English. So it will be Hindi, English and Solovian and German, Spanish and English. To show how speakers employ particular languages to convey information that goes beyond uh, their actual words, especially to define social situations. So what happens in each case is that one language expresses a we type solidarity among participants. Now, 
and is therefore deemed suitable for uh, in-group and informal activities. Now, whereas the other language is considered appropriate to out-group and more formal relationships, now particularly of an impersonal kind. So, um, the we, the distinction is by no means absolute. So, fine shading is possible in switching also. For that is, certain topics may be discussed in either code, and the particular code made itself helps to redefine uh, the social situation or to shift that definition as the case may be. Now, Woolard in 1989 provides a good example of this kind of shift from Barcelona. So, Catalans use Catalan only to each other. They use Castilian to non-Catalans uh, and they will even switch to Castilian if they uh, become aware that the other person is speaking Catalan and a Castilian uh, accent. So, Catalan um, is only for Catalans. It also never happens that one party would speak Catalan and the other Castilian, even though such a conversation is theoretically possible, since all Ca Catalans are bilingual. But uh, it's possible uh, linguistically, but socially it will not be possible. So a particular group of people may employ different kinds of code switching for different purposes. So in their account for how the population of uh, Hemisburg, a uh, small Norwegian town of 1,300 ha inhabitants, uh, located close to the Arctic Circle, now use a local northern dialect of Norwegian, Ranamal, and one of the standard varieties. So, Bokmal, Bloom, and Gomers in 1972 show how both situational and metaphorical code switching are used. Now, situational Switching occurs when a teacher gives some kind of formal lecture in Bokmal, but the discussion that follows is in Ranamal. So metaphorical switching is a more complicated phenomenon. Now one type uh, tends to occur when government officials and local citizens uh, transact business together. Although the variety generally used in such circumstances is Bokmal, it is not unusual for both parties to use the occasional Renamal expression for special effect. So, Bloom and Gumpers also discovered that while most locals through a thought they used Renamal exclusively in certain uh, in casual conversations and reserved a Bokmal for use in uh, school and church and on formal occasions, such was not the case. So tape recordings revealed switches to Bokmal to achieve certain effects. Now, moreover, the participants uh, were not conscious of these uh, switches. And even after such switching to Bokmal was pointed out to them, they declared they would not do it again. So they continued to do so as further tappings revealed. So with such persistence, when they were uh, taping them, then yes, when for, uh, further they, when they, it was revealed that Bokmal was pointed out to them and they knew that yes, they were switching from uh, that language to the other. Now, even unconsciously, you see? So such persistence suggested that metaphorical code switching is, um, in such situations, is deeply ingrained and that uh, it's our subtle but strong uh, functions. So not only do datives of Hemnes Burget find the existence of two varieties of Norwegian useful to them in demonstrating Wienese, Ranamal, and Bainese in Bokmal, but they also are able to employ both varieties together in such ways as to express fine um, gradations of feelings for others. So involvement with the topic politeness to strangers and difference to the officials. So Gumpers in 1982, uh, on page 48 and 58 when he referred uh, to in his research, also reports on an interesting situation in the Gale Valley of Austria, um, near the borders of the former Yugoslavia and Italy, which shows how two languages 
uh, Solvian and German are used and what kinds of code switching occurs and what changes appears to be in progress. So uh, Solvian has um, been spoken in the valley but the valley is part of Austria so German is the prestige language there. So when we talk about uh, the prestige language then we would say yes that German would be the prestige language because um, when you are talking about the Gale Valley of Austria and near the borders of the former Yugoslavia and the Italy, which show how two languages, Solvian and German, are used, what kinds of code switching occur, and what changes appear to be in progress. So, um, according to that, then Solvian has long been spoken in the valley, but the valley is part Austria, uh, so German is the prestige language. Now, from all of these slides, what do you understand is that uh, once again, when you are shifting from a language to a different language, uh, you are code switching from one to another. When, let's say, for example, you are uh, speaking Urdu, so the same thing like in Austrian and German and the prestige language. So you code switch from Urdu to English very easily, you see. And when you are code switching, then uh, the reason why you are uh, successful in it would be that it's easier for you to go about doing that um, because your part used to speaking uh, English in your formal education and uh, you are used to uh, speaking the other language differently so what you are doing is that you are trying to shift from one language to another uh, more easily it's a natural process for you you see shifting from English to Urdu or Urdu to English because if you're used to speaking both the languages but in case if you're not used to speaking both the languages then it is difficult so when you say that it's difficult then that does mean that uh, it's not possible to uh, go ahead and be comfortable with both the languages so understanding one language and understanding both the different languages would be very different but, like in these, they say that in the borders that, uh, of Austria, uh, near the borders of the former Yugoslavia and Italy, which shows how the two languages, Solvian and German, are used, that means that they do have uh, two languages all over the place, you see? And those two languages um, are used frequently. So a person uh, living on the border would be called a bilingual. A bilingual would be a person who can speak two different languages. Okay, so when uh, Gumpritz was speaking about the Gale Valley in Australia and how the languages in Yugoslavia and Italy, the borders of it, that there are two different languages spoken on the borders. So once when you see that in different cultures, in different societies, you have to speak in a different way. So um, crucial to social linguistics analysis is the concept of the prestige. So certain speech habits are assigned a positive or a negative rule uh, which is then applied to the speaker. Now this can operate on many levels. So uh, when we say that it can operate on many levels, uh, it can be realized on the uh, level of the individual sound phenomenon. So as Lebov discovered in investigating pronunciation of the post -voc vocalic or in the northeastern USA, or uh, on the Marco scale of language choice uh, as realized in the various uh, diglossias that exist throughout the uh, world. Now we're, um, we would say that Swiss or German language or Slovene or German language, um, a high German is perhaps most well known. So an important application of the social linguistic theory is that speakers choose a variety when making a speech act which um, rather consciously or subconsciously they would choose from. So um, main applications w of social linguistics would be that it must be remembered that a social linguist might determine through study of social attitudes uh, that a particular vernacular could be considered appropriate language used in a business or a professional setting. Now, when we consider that in this situation, when people are speaking different languages on the borders of a country, now, because they're conducting businesses on those borders also, 
So they could be importing or exporting goods and they're speaking to the different um, community peoples, different countries, uh, the, um, the people come in from different countries for trade or for business. So the study of language variation would be concerned with social constraints determining the language uh, in its contextual environment. Now code switching is the term given to the use of different varieties of language and uh, in social, different social situations also. So William Lebeau is often regarded as the founder um, of the study of social linguistics. So he is especially noted for introducing the quantitative study of language, noted for um, of the variation and change in language also, and making the sociology of language into a scientific discipline. So social linguistic interviews are an integral part of the collecting, part, uh, collecting data f uh, for social linguistic studies. So there is an interviewer who is conducting the study, let's say, and a subject or informant who is the interviewee. Now in order to grasp, uh, get a grasp on specific linguistic forms and how it is used in the dialect of a subject, uh, a variety of methods are used to elicit certain registers of speech. Now there are five different uh, illicit um, styles ranging from formal to casual. So people living on the borders would uh, maybe be speaking with the people they trade with in a formal way and uh, with their local people, uh, neighbors or brothers and sisters and family, they might speak in their uh, low variety language, low prestige language. and. Um, their code or their style would be more informal. So ranging from formal to casual, now the most formal style would be elicited to by having the subject read a list of minimal pairs. Minimal pairs are pairs of words that differ in one phoneme. So such as cat and bat, having the same um, subject read a word list will uh, elicit a formal register, but generally not as formal as the MP. So the reading um, passage, the RP style is maybe next down in the formal register. So the minimal pairs maybe uh, won't be generally not formal, but the RP would. And the interview style, the IS, is when the interview can finally get into eliciting a more casual speech from the subject. So for example, if they are trading at the borders and they need to speak in different languages in Australia and German, so they uh, would need to be trained in uh, both the languages, so they would be bilingual. Now during the uh, IS, the interviewer can converse with the subject and uh, try to draw out of him an even more casual sort of speech, let's say, by asking him to recall childhood memories or um, maybe a near-death experience, maybe, okay? In which case the subject will get deeply involved with the story since strong emotions are often attached to these memories. So, um, of course, the most sought-after style of speech is the casual uh, style CS. This type of speech is difficult, if not impossible, to elicit because uh, of the observer's paradox. So the closest one might come to the CS in an interview uh, is when the subject is interrupted by a close friend or a family member. Now, or perhaps must answer the phone, the CS is used in a completely unmonitored environment where the subject feels most uncomfortable and will use their natural vernacular over, uh, overtly thinking about it. So the fundable co fundamental concepts of people uh, code switching in their languages would be when, while the study of social linguistics is very broad, there are a few fundamental concepts on which may sh many of the social linguist um, inquiries depend. So once again we come back to the high uh, prestige variety and the low prestige variety. Now um, crucial to the social linguistic analysis is the concept of the prestige. So it is very prestigious that uh, to speak the high prestige language in a formal situation and the low prestige in a casual manner. 
and so that's how people would act when they are dealing with trade uh, in a different country also so according to a speech community now let's say uh, it is a concept in social linguistics that describes a more or less discrete group of people uh, who use language in a unique and mutually accepted way among themselves so speech uh, communities can be members of a profession with a, a so specialized jargon now distinct social uh, groups for example uh, like high school students or hip hop fans or even tight knit uh, groups like families and friends members of speech communities will often develop um, slang or jargons to uh, serve the group's special purposes and priorities also so social network also matters a lot now understanding language in society means that one also um, you would have to understand the social networks in which language is embedded. A social network is another way of describing a particular speech community in terms of relations between individual members in a community. So even people living like we've discussed that Gumper's research was all about peop different countries and different people, the way they lived and uh, how they interacted with each other. So a network could be loose or a tight depending on how members interact with each other. For instance, an officer factory may be considered a tight community because all members interested in, um, they are interested in each other. Now, a large course with 100 plus students uh, will be a loser community because uh, students may only interact with the instructor and maybe one or two other students. So, a multiplex community is one in which members have multiple relationships with each other. And, uh, for instance, in some neighborhoods, members may live on the same street, working for the same employer or even the uh, intermarry. So the looseness or tightness of a social network may affect their speech patterns adopted by a speaker. For instance, uh, Sylvie Dubius and Barbara Horworth um, found that speakers in one Cajun Louisiana community were more likely to pronounce the English letters in a different way than they would. Uh, so if they participated in a relatively dense social network, now that is uh, had strong local ties and interacted with many other speakers in the community, uh, the less likely of their networks were uh, looser, um, that is fewer local ties, a social uh, network may apply to them Marco level of a community or a city, but also to the interpersonal levels of neighborhoods or uh, single families. So recently we would say that social networks have been formed by the internet um, through chat rooms, MySpace groups, organizations and online dating services. So when we say internal and external language. Now, what do we mean by that? So in Chomsky and uh, linguistic, a uh, distinction is drawn. You see, when uh, by 1982, it was long later that people started realizing the uh, differences between how languages were spoken in different communities. But in the time of Chomsky's uh, linguistic, a distinction is drawn between the I language, internal language, and the E language, external language. So in this context, internal language applies to the study of syntax and semantics and um, in language on the abstract level. As mentally represented uh, knowledge in the native speaker's language. So external language applies to language in a social context and um, we would say that behavioral habits shared by a community um, internal language analysis operate on assumption that all the native speakers would of a language are quite homogeneous in how um, they process and perceive language also so external language fields such as social linguistics attempts to explain why this is in fact not the case. So 
many social linguistics reject the distinction between I and E languages on the uh, grounds that it is based on mentless uh, view of language. So on this view, grammar is the first and foremost of international, interactional social phenomenon or the Eleanor Ochis or Emmanuel Sigurov or Sandra Thompson's. So what we learn is that uh, from all this research work that um, many situations have changed and people let's say in Germany, uh, in, Germany in uh, Switzerland, in England, in Austria, they are sort of forced to use uh, the different languages because they themselves are not sure of how they're supposed to uh, be uh, distributing the language according to society. So um, once again, when uh, Gumpers did a detailed research in this, uh, he found different countries. He uh, joined, uh, he looked at Arabic as one. He looked at German. He looked at um, the Swiss language or the languages spoken in Switzerland, like the Western German and the Eastern German. So there is a variety. You see, different researchers have uh, looked at different works. And according to them, it is very, very uh, common for them to realize that um, they have to, after this research, that they have to choose different uh, sets of languages for different uh, cultures and communities. So according to the situation in which they belong, or the society that they belong to uh, matters a lot also. So it's not all about the people researching how these different languages are used in these different la communities or how a bilingual or a multilingual person would be treated in a certain society, um, whatever relating to him. So some places they treat bilinguals very good, some places they treat uh, multilinguals very nicely. So it all depends on the situations that a human being is in. So um, that is it for today, students. And uh, I will see you in the next lecture. Thank you so much. And I hope you will review these slides to try to understand the difference between the languages. Thank you so much. Good day.